Okay, well, thanks for that introduction. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I want to take you through the methods that Derek and myself employed to date the uh, Doggerland cores. Before I do that, we just want to acknowledge some people. Oh. Yeah, in St Andrews, I have to thank the technical support of Rebecca, Neil and Ayush. And uh, Rebecca deserves a special mention because she was an undergraduate that won a Carnegie Trust scholarship uh, to look at some of these materials. And over in CERC, we list to thank the whole of the Rideau Carbon dating team. So key to re reconstructing the paleogeographies and environments of Doggerland is a robust chronological framework. And this has been constructed here from at least 22 of the 109 recovered cores. And now we've got a very extensive data set. So we've got 178 real carbon constraints, 139 OSL constraints, and they are augmented by luminescence stratigraphies constructed from both proxy and calibrated data. So if it's not already apparent, uh, Derek, he leads the radio carbon and I lead the OSL. So what's more, we've got a great spatial distribution of core with a representative selection from across the Southern North Sea, including the, the Southern River Valley that we've heard about this morning, the Silver Lake, sorry, the Silver Pit Lake, and then also Brown Bank. And moreover, we've got a great temporal distribution, which spans everything from uh, the late glacial up to the final inundation. And I've given this an exclamation mark here because you can see in some of the cores, we have evidence of a uh, slightly later inundation for Dogger Bank. But as you can imagine, constructing these chron chronologies hasn't been without difficulties. So with regard to OSL dating, it's the sheer number of environmental settings that we attempted to investigate that has presented a challenge to dating. And this has been compounded by the fact that we're uh, examining sediments from core. So I don't have the same quantities of sediment that I normally would use in the study. This diagram on the right then shows how the range of paleo environments that we're interested in, well, they have a range of environmental conditions that are uh, conclusive to dating, um, and also what it shows is that not all the sediment has the same response. And as you can imagine, we're covering a massive area here. So the lithologies are very different and the minerals within them are very different and they have a range of luminescence responses. So again, I've attempted to show that this, on this diagram to the right. A fourth challenge we have is uh, how do we reconstruct the dose rates to the sediments within these cores? Um, but thankfully, we do have some so, uh, solutions. One of these is the construction of luminescent stratigraphies. And there'll be more on this in a second. And the second is we can look at uh, down profile trends in radionuclide concentrations so that we can uh, model our environmental dose rates uh, as robust as we can. So I'm going to demonstrate the processes, by, sorry, the methods by looking at two cores. Uh, in terms of OSL, we're going to concentrate on 1A, and then when we come to the radiocarbon, we're going to concentrate on 34. So you've heard of both those cores th this morning. 1A is located at the head of the Southern River Valley, and it had interest to us because this is where the potential tsunami deposits were. So this is what I show on the, on the left. This is a photo of the core. We've got seven units being identified by Martin Bates. Uh, just to point out, four and seven, we know that they are tidal mud flats. And in fact, and this is interrupted in five and six by these uh, shelly gravels. And it's that interval there that uh, potentially relates to the historic tsunami. So I've shown this core schematically in the center here with uh, units one to seven and their pale environments there. So let's have a look at it. So there's that schematic. So the first potential solution is looking at luminescent stratigraphies. So what I show here, uh, this is depth and core, and then this is the net signal intensities. Uh, what is a net signal intensity? Well, this is shown on the right here. So this is uh, two samples. We have a young sediment sample and an old sediment sample. 
And what I'm just showing is one measurement cycle with a portable work cell unit. What we have is luminescence on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And we choose to look at two stimulation methods, infrared, so that's our IRSL, and our blue light stimulated, so that's our OSL. And I think it's quite apparent. You can see that the young sediment has a low uh, luminescence count, whereas the older sediment has a higher luminescence count. So what does that mean for this core? We can see that each of these units then is characterized by a distinct set of luminescence characteristics. And importantly, you can see the stratigraphic breaks, which relate to temporal breaks and time within the core. Well, what it does show is we have very complex depositional sequences. So the next stage is to take those samples uh, from just that first uh, proxy record that we had at, we collected at core sampling to the lab. So we take each of those samples through um, some simple analytical uh, procedures so that for each sample, we have uh, an apparent dose. So this is um, comparable to the burial dose that you'd, you've heard mentioned in OSL data. So I'm just going to simplify this and just return to that one plot. Uh, the range in uh, store doses isn't too relevant, but what I just want to uh, draw your attention to is where we have stratigraphic progressions, because that tells us uh, something about sedimentation. It tells us if the, uh, the sediment package is consistent and coherent. And where we have temporal breaks, because that's where we have our unconformities. So that's great. Uh, we can start to identify uh, specific horizons in the core that we wish to date. But again, there you go. We have the complex depositional histories that we still need to interpret. So I'm just now going to zoom in onto the, these two units and show you what that data looks like. So that's it here. There's our relative plot and then our calibrated plot. I think you can see that there's a, at least three couplets in here going from low to higher dose, low to higher dose, low to higher dose. So that's what we're seeing in the luminescence. But what do we see in other proxies? Well, this is some of the inferences from the uh, core scanning. Uh, and this is uh, similar depth. So if I just do this and overlay this on top, well, this is potentially three waves within that deposit. And we're seeing it both in the luminescence and the geochemistry. So with construction, constructing these profiles, we have a good sense of the sedimentation histories. So we know where we, or sorry, we can produce in samples where we think we'll get good dates. But the next challenge then is reconstructing the dose rates and how do we go about doing that? We've got various methods uh, available to us. We can uh, directly measure radionuclide concentrations uh, by CFMS or uh, gamma uh, spectrometry. But we can also look, use core scanning to look at uh, down core variations. So the sum of all this is we can uh, be quite robust when we say we have a dose rate at any one point, sorry, any one depth in the core. And the third solution that we have is we can look at how the different samples relate stratigraphically. So this is a age depth model being put together by Derek uh, with individual OSL constraints shown and their position in the, in the sequence. This is great and interesting because you can see what the, the potential horizons where we've got incomplete bleaching of sediment. And if your sediment's incompletely bleached, you'll have an age overestimate. Uh, and it also shows down here that we had a radiocarbon constraint from a shell. And in this case, that is residual uh, and overestimating the age. So in terms of ELF1A, we are able to have a robust chronology through that unit that spans from 6,000 at the top, which is the base of the mudflats, down to 9.2 at the base. And the uh, high energy deposits, uh, they come in at between 8 and 8.2, a mean age of 8.1, so yes, they are a contender for Storager. So that first part at the top talked about the OSL. Now we're going to look at the radiocarbon chronologies. So as with OSL, it has its own set of challenges. 
So taponomic and technical challenges can impact the development of radial carbon based chronologies. What's important for dating these units is that we have a tight security on the material that's been investigated. And how we've gone about that in this project, project is we've looked at dating multiple fractions. So we've looked at both the humic acid and the human fraction. So both Ben and Tom alluded to this earlier. Um, so the human fraction, for those that don't know, well, that's any organic matter that's recovered. Whereas the humic acid is a byproduct of the humification process. So the human fraction is acid and alkali insoluble, whereas the human humic acid precipitates out of a highly acidic solution. So it's possible to separate the two in the lab. Why is that important? Well, the human fraction can be affected by taphonic processes, and it might introduce residual material to the core. Whereas the humic acids, well, they will remain in solution in a weak acidic environment, and they can be somewhat mo mobile through the profile. But what's great is when the two fractions yield statistically consistent dates, we can have increased confidence in the security of the samples and the robustness of the chronological model. So we're going to return to ELF 34, which is the core that both uh, Ben and Tom talked about. And in this first slide, we're going to look at the relationship between the two dated fractions. Uh, and you can see them coming through in pairs here. You can see for the top uh, part of this, up to a depth of 172 centimeters, we've got good consistency, so that's great. Whereas beneath that, the two fractions diverge. When we resolve these potential uh, conflicts, uh, we can then uh, reconstruct age depth models. So there, here's the age depth model now for 34. What's really great about this is it removes us thinking about individual constraints on certain horizons in the core to be able to talk about chronology for the whole core. So we can query this model to date uh, specific events in the, um, the chronology. So just to highlight this, and this is referring back to uh, Ben's presentation, we want to date for the start Holocene and the start stereo. So there's the query and it comes in. So we have a date for the start of the stadio in 34 to between 13 and 12,000. Uh, and you can read the rest of the dates there. Uh, so we realized um, when Tom was giving his presentation that we've mistook uh, the description. Uh, so we've taken the base of the peat to be the base of pollen. So we can exclude that uh, bottom date and we'll come back to that. What's also great about having the two methods, uh, the two chronological methods, is we can compare and contrast. Uh, so with the reference to 1A, I showed that the radial carbon date was residual. The OSL dates from 34, well, they're the opposite. They've underestimated the, the correct depositional age. Why is that? When OSL dating, I'm sampling the, the mineral rich horizons, and I don't tend to sample the organic rich horizons. Those organic rich horizons will have a lower dose rate than the, uh, the horizons I've sampled, but because all my dose rate measurements are taken on the mineral rich horizons, uh, I have overestimated my dose rates, which has resulted in underestimation in age. So because we have such a large data set, we can um, apply these methods across the cores, and we can be sure when we say we have a date or a specific core that we do. So that's my 15 minutes up. So to conclude, uh, I thought I'd just throw up this slide at the start uh, and say we have built a robust chronology for uh, those 22 investigated cores. And this has provided the temporal framework on which to test the paleogeographical and environmental reconstruction. So I can take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, checking on the, the, the chat box, um, we haven't had any questions come in yet, but if anybody does, now would be a good time. Um, while we're waiting for that, actually, um, Tim, the, 
Oh, hello. No. So we have from Michael Grant um, with pair, the paired dating. Have you been able to model the effect of changing moisture content over the burial period? Uh, we've done that to some extent. We've just done the OSL side. Now we have the, the two data sets, both radiocarbon and OSL. We are going to look at um, modeling the age depth models for both. And then we can start to look at how much, well, what you'd have to do to change the moisture content to bring it in line with the, the radiocarbon. So yeah, that's, that's the next stage. Okay. Um, from Irene, um, gosh, Wyon. Um, I hope I got that pronounced correctly. In the first core, you showed two outliers in OSL dates. How certain can you say this is due to incomplete bleaching is the question. Yeah. So uh, in general, it's easier to um, invoke a situation where you have older sediment coming in and not seeing daylight than younger material coming into the profile and working its way down. More so because we have our profiles. So we can say if we think that there is evidence of material moving up and down a core. Yeah, so that allows us to exclude uh, all the dates that would be younger being, uh, being too young because of material working in. And it's more likely that the material sitting to the right, so older in age, is residual. Okay. Um, we have... Um... A uh, couple more questions coming through. So Mark Bateman asks, can you model the dose rate from your extensive scan data to correct the age under estimations? Yeah, that's one of the, the next stages. Yeah. Um, and Zoe, Zoe Outram, did you consider radiocarbon dating plant macros as well as comparing them to the human and humic fractions? Um, yes, uh, we did. Ask. And there's Derek to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Ben kind of highlighted earlier today that the, uh, there's quite a bit of compression and actually there, there really weren't any plant macros that were being identified um, kind of within the peats. So we were stuck with humic and human fractions. Uh -huh. Okay, and um, we've got one more question here from Michael Grant. Um, did you attempt any K feldspar dating? No, we haven't done. That's short and sweet. Yeah. 